morning, everybody, and thank you all for your lovely remarks, Clarice. Um, so I'm going to introduce Michael, and it's, it's a real honor to have him join us today. But before I do that, I just want to put a context in, into the conversation. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're all touched by automation these days. I mean, you know, you can walk into a restaurant, you'll order through a kiosk, um, you know, you're going through a bridge, you don't have to pay a toll anymore, you go right through, there's no more toll, toll booth operators, um, and even some of you might have that darn vacuum that rolls around your house and bumps into walls and keeps, keeps going, so, you know, what strikes me um, as somebody in workforce is that a lot of those things that are now automated used to be operated by people. And so, you know, somebody used to come and take my order at a restaurant, or I used to have to pay my money to a toll booth operator, or, you know, I actually did my own vacuuming. Um, so it's clear that automation is just like pervasive, and it's not going away, it's, it's only going to increase. And so I wanted to, um, you know, I, I think the executive committee, or the, actually the entire board last time when we were talking, were, um, were sort of having this discussion Discussion and saying we really should get our arms around what's what is the future of automation and its impact on jobs, um, and so we invited Michael uh, the McKinsey Global Institute just put out a report. Um, it, it was entitled "Jobs Lost, Jobs Gained: Workforce Transition in a Time of Automation." I read the report. I was completely struck by what McKinsey was observing, and particularly around in cities like New York, where I actually think we might have a little bit of an advantage to other cities that might be sort of cities that are operating in one sector only. We have the, uh, the benefit of many, many sectors in the city that are, are not only uh, well entrenched, but also growing. And so how do we take advantage of that? What are we going to foresee in terms of the next five years, 10 years? How should we be preparing our adults today, as well as our young people in the K through 12 system? I think these are all kind of questions that we're grappling with. And certainly, as you as employers are seeing automation come into your workplaces, what does that mean in terms of the jobs that you're going to have available? How are the current jobs going to be adjusted and or maybe go away completely? I mean, these are all questions that I think workforce development boards are grappling with. Um, I was down in Washington about a year ago with other workforce development boards around the country with the uh, mayors, and everybody's kind of like wringing their hands wondering what and how to, to sort of plan for this this new wave. And you know, I think that it, it, it sort of spans the, uh, in terms of, of, of opinion of how this is going to impact jobs, you're going to get folks who say this is massive unemployment coming down the pike. We should be looking at things like you know universal basic income. To no, no, no. We've gone through this before. We've weathered the storm, and in fact, new jobs and more jobs will be coming into the workplace. So how do we, you know, how do we think about this? And we, uh, as I said, I'm so so pleased to see Michael come join us today to talk a little bit about it, and then we'll have some discussion. So Michael, it's all yours. <coughs> Good morning. I'm going to awkwardly hold this if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> you should tell me if, you, if I should just sit down. Uh, thanks so much, Barb, Chris, uh, Ravel, and everybody for uh, inviting me uh, to start a discussion today. Um, as Barb said, I'm a, uh, I'm a partner at the McKinsey Global Institute. I sometimes describe that as being a private sector professor. So uh, MGI, as we affectionately call it, is uh, the research arm of McKinsey Company, um, a global uh, management consulting firm. Uh, I think all of you have seen all these headlines. As Barb mentioned, you know, I, I have a, a robot uh, vacuum at home as well. But you know, you, you see these these Twitter uh, these these Twitter videos of robots, you know, doing backflips. But then, you know, we all know, you know, in, in, in employment, we're seeing everything. Not just physical robots, but software robots increasingly be able to do what people are able to do. And as Barb made mention to, you know, all these all these headlines, you know, very very smart people. Although I would argue not practitioners of artificial intelligence say things like there will be mass unemployment, what are we going to have to do about that? So these are scary headlines, and as I sometimes joke, well, when I'm scared, I turn to analysis, because I'm a bit of a geek. So uh, we, what we want to do is take a little bit of the uh, analytical rigor that we take to a, a number of problems and look at this question about to what extent and what pace automation might take hold in the, in the global economy. So to be clear, this is not an analysis of New York City, but rather uh, the global economy, I do think this has implications for the city. Um, and then what the potential for additional demand for labor might be and how, you know, how might we characterize that in terms of the workforce of the future. 
what it will take to transition from where we are now to where we might be in the future, uh, and then what the potential implications might be for, um, for incomes. So uh, there, there have been other pieces of research that looked at, um, and analyzed the problem from an occupational level. Uh, we actually think that that's not sufficiently granular. Because again, if we think about our jobs, if we think about the jobs of people we know or employ, et cetera, in general, everybody's job is made up of a whole bunch of constituent activities, each of which has a different potential or set of technologies which might automate those activities. So rather than look at occupations, we looked at all the constituent activities that BLS publishes. To be technical, it's the detailed work activities, which are about 2,000 of them. And for each of those, we scored against 18 different capabilities which potentially could be automated. Some of them are physical, so fine motor skills, gross motor skills, and navigating in the physical world. Some of them are sensory, how do we use vision, you know, our auditory senses, et cetera, to recognize things, et cetera. Uh, some of them are cognitive, so can you recognize a known pattern, develop a novel pattern, do logical problem solving. Um, some of them are linguistic, so understanding natural language, producing natural language. And we even included social and emotional capabilities, so the ability to recognize the human emotion, process of that, and then you know, respond appropriately. So for all 2,000 activities that we pay people to do in the economy, we understand against these 18 different capabilities whether or not they're needed at all and at what level of performance is required in order to successfully perform all 2,000 detailed work activities. Then we went and looked at all of the technologies that we could find. So corporate research labs, products you could buy off the shelf, um, academic papers, etc. To understand what the current state of the art is against all of those 18 capabilities and then just map those things together and said, look, what percentage of time do we pay people to, to work in the global economy that could be automated by adapting technologies which already exist? And it's roughly 50%. Now, just pause. We're not positing 50% unemployment tomorrow. Because what I, I, I use the whole mouthful of words there, right? Could potentially be automated by adapting currently demonstrated technologies. That doesn't mean you can buy this technology off the shelf right now. That means the piece parts exist which have that capability. It would actually have to be brought together in order to make that work. And then you'd have to have a positive business case. And there are a number of reasons why that's not going to happen tomorrow. But at least theoretically, that level of capability is possible. So now, if, if we want to ask what types of capabilities or what types of jobs have the highest potential for automation. I, again, I could go through all 2,000 activities. We don't have enough time for that. Um, we broke it down into seven different categories. There are three types of categories of activities which have the highest potential for automation. Now the first one is unsurprising. It is actually the robotic vacuum line. It's physical activities in predictable environments. Now this is a classic thing that everyone would think of as being you know, manufacturing on an assembly line. Right? Physical activity, so a well understood environment, you know where peace is going to be, etc. But the other two you know, large categories are interesting as well. Collecting data and processing data. Now again, it's, it's maybe unsurprising that there's a bunch of this work going on in the city, uh, amongst other places, which fits that category. And you might think of that, for example, as back office processing in a financial institution. Right? So you have all these transactions going through. Increasingly, institutions are trying to do straight through processing where the, you know, the computer does all of it. But still, there's a lot of work going on, whether it's underwriting mortgages, um, you know, all kinds of transactions where people are are doing that, and you know that's you know that's lower, relatively lower in the corporate hierarchy, oftentimes. But then, if you walk through an, an institution, you walk through an organization, whether it's a government agency or a bank or a, you know a, a management consulting firm, and you ask people who have MBAs, if you ask people who have JDs, if you ask people who have MDs, what percentage of your time is spent collecting data and processing data? And it's usually a double-digit percentage. And so that's one of our other findings, that when you look at things at the level of activities, it's actually quite rare where an, an entire occupation can be automated. Rather, it's probably piece parts of everybody's job. In fact, if we think about this tough where, you know, there's probably parts of everyone's job that's fairly highly automatable, and many times it's the stuff we don't really enjoy doing, right? So, I mean, there's some, you know, that, that's a silver lining from an individual standpoint. I think so, the silver lining of automation from a broader standpoint is as follows. If you think about the past 50 years, in the largest economies in the world, including the United States, economic growth on average is about 3.5%, GDP growth, 3.5% annually. 
Half of that has come about because of increases in productivity. So all that work that we try to do to increase the efficiency, effectiveness of the things we do every day. And half of that because we have more people working. Because generally populations have increased. We have more women in the workforce. We have people living longer because health you know, care has been improving. What's going to happen to that second half of economic growth, or the drivers of economic growth going forward? It's roughly going to disappear. In the US, we'll continue to have some population growth if immigration continues. But basically, we won't have enough workers to continue the economic growth rate that we've had for the past 50 years. And so one way to think about it is we need all the robots we can get. We need all the AI we can get because we don't have enough workers. We just need to make sure that the people who are displaced by the technology keep working. So that's another reason why, in fact, you don't necessarily want to slow down the adoption of this technology. We just need to make sure that the transition can happen. So let me just talk uh, real briefly about why I'm not positing 50% unemployment. So this is a graph which roughly says, uh, on the y-axis here is the uh, basically a percentage of time in activities we currently pay people to do in the economy. Uh, the x-axis is time. When I spend time as a management consultant, I rarely show charts out to 2090, but anyway, here we go. <laughs> um, this orange curve here shows what we believe to be technically possible. So you see it starts at 50%, and it increases over time. Why is that? Because technology continues to improve its capability going forward. Uh, why is it not aligned and rather a big fat S? Because, well, first of all, we also know that we're not, you know, we, we can't predict the future precisely, so it reflects a, a, a variety of different scenarios. <coughs> but the other thing is, it's not just an imprecision about projection. It's the fact that, in fact, how quickly this happens is dependent on decisions that we and other people will make. How much we will invest in developing the technology. How quickly, you know, we're going to think about that. So, this is what we believe to be technically possible. But then, as I said before, it takes time and money in order to develop a solution that automates an individual activity. You need to have a positive business case. When technology is first introduced, it tends to have a high cost. You have to net that out against the cost of human labor. There's a, I live in San Francisco, across the street from me, there's a permit for a company to have a burger flipping robot, right? basically a fast food robot. I doubt that thing will be less expensive than you know a, a low paid food service job, worker's job right now. At some point, it might be. I, I'm sure that the idea for that restaurant is to be a bit of a gimmick. But in any case, I mean, you need to think about a positive business case. By the way, it's not just labor cost reductions. In some cases, the other benefits of automation are more important, whether it's you know, consistency, throughput, uh, reduced variance, uh, all kinds of other benefits. Anyway, even, at, even after you have a positive business case, there's usually a, uh, a, a variety of companies in terms of how fast they decide to adopt technology. And so we looked at dozens of different technologies over the past half century. The time between commercial availability and the eventual plateau in adoption <coughs> was in the range of 8 to 28 years. You might say, come on, you know, technology is accelerating, right? Isn't everything happening faster, faster, faster? And we kind of believe that in terms of technology development. But technology adopted is gated, adoption is gated by us or our organizations. As much as we in management consultant try to speed up the pace at which, at, at which organizations can change, it's hard, it's super hard work. So even if you think about a technology like social media or Facebook, right? Think, oh, come on, that, there are more people working, on, and there are more users of Facebook. I almost said customers, but remember, if you're not paying for it, you're the product, not the customer. Um, there are more users of Facebook than any country has citizens. So you think, well, that must have been adopted quickly. When did Facebook start? 2004. So that's, that's, again, that fits right in the 8 to 28 years. And by the way, it's still growing, right? So I mean, so we do think it takes real time to adopt technologies. So we can model out all of those things. I said 50% of the world's activities could be automated now. The middle, again, there's a wide swath of scenarios. The middle point at which that might potentially happen in the global economy, Call it 2055, right? 10 US presidential terms. Now, there's a scenario that's 20 years earlier and a scenario that's 20 years later, but nevertheless, there's some time to adapt as we adopt. So the other thing that we did, so we published some of that work in January. We recently published another piece of work that looks specifically at 2030. Why? Because we wanted to understand, we wanted a, a time horizon where we could think about 
what the new jobs might be or what the additional demand for labor might be. So this question as to whether or not there would actually be mass unemployment. We know we can't predict the future again. But we said, let's just model a limited set of drivers of potential, of potential additional labor demand. Remember, this is global, but you can think about what it might mean for New York. First of all, rising incomes. There are another billion people around the world who are entering the consuming class in the next couple of decades. You know, basically, you know, people are getting richer, and they're going to need more media, more financial services, more apparel, more cars. Aging populations, which I just described as an as a economic drag, on the other hand, it will drive demand for certain activities. Right? It will drive demand for additional health care services, home care, etc. Developing and, and deploying the technology itself, you know, there's, there are jobs for people like that, Silicon Alley, etc. Infrastructure spending and building spending. Right? We need to fix infrastructure, we'll need to build more of it as more people uh, entering the consuming class. We, you know, again, Purely for economic reasons, we'll see what, what degree you know, policy will affect things, but again, there'll be a change in the uh, energy generation around the world, there'll be more smart grid, there'll be decommissioning of other uh, systems, and there'll be efficiency. Um, and then there's a bunch of work, as you all know, which is unpaid and currently isn't in the market, you know, primarily done by women at home, whether it's childcare, cleaning, uh, cooking, etc. Some of that work might enter the marketplace as well. Um, we're seeing that happen. So you know, we have two scenarios. One is a trend line, which basically looks at the overall trends across countries. We also have a step-up scenario uh, where these sets of activities um, have additional uh, drivers of demand. If you add up all of the potential labor demand from these seven drivers, even net of the fact that some of the activities within these drivers might be automated, right? first of all, it's a big number, right? 550 to almost a, a billion demand for FTEs. Basically, again, if you go back to our automation scenarios and you net that out against these type of numbers, roughly speaking, we think there's enough labor demand to offset the effects of automation at, at, and for most of the scenarios we can model out. So this question is, is there enough work for people to do it, at least through 2030? Probably. And by the way, this doesn't even include the jobs we haven't thought of, right? I mean, um, I, I tell this story not because it's a large number of jobs, but just because it's indicative, right? I mean, there were, there were no mobile app developers 15 years ago. Uh, across the bay from where I live in San Francisco, there's a, there's a stadium for people to pay to watch other people professionally play video games. <laughs> okay, I, would, I mean, I'm supposed to be a tech expert. I would not have predicted that five years ago, right? <laughs> so, and we're always, and it's not, obviously, that's not a big occupational category, but we're always generating new, well, hopefully, we'll continue to generate new occupations, new activities, new jobs. That does require dynamism in the market. So, that all said, do we think there's enough work for people to do? Yes. Do we think there'll be changes in the types of work that will be done? Yes. Because again, if you net out, again, this is limited modeling, but if you net out you know, all of the activities which we think potentially could be automated and the additional demand, again, those three categories, generally we would see the mix of work that we pay people to do have less of these types of activities and more of these types of activities, applying expertise, interacting with stakeholders, including customers, managing and developing people, and even some predict even even some physical activities, but increasingly in unpredictable environments. Uh, again, this is a limited. Uh, we're not showing all of the occupational categories where we see additional demand, but here are some of the ones that we do. Uh, again, we we looked at uh, about uh, we looked at 46 countries. Our our database number goes to 50. So you know we have Germany, Japan, uh, China, Mexico, and India on this chart. But roughly speaking, here are some categories where, where we'll, we'll mostly see additional demand in this first column, which is the U.S., uh, the blue meaning uh, increases, the orange meaning decreases, right? So care providers, uh, educators, management, managers and executives, professionals of various types, clearly the, the tech field will continue to increase. By the way, this isn't a step-up scenario. You'll see more in builders if we invest in infrastructure. Uh, and the creatives, which is a small category, but again, it's, it's hard to automate. Categories where we potentially could see decreases, um, Slightly concerning, but a bunch of customer interaction, um, uh, occupations, office support, again, collecting data, processing data, a high percentage of that work. Um, some of these are physical activities in predictable environments, as I described them before, uh, and then also some of these, even in unpredictable environments, depending on the mix. And again, you know, this is broad categories. I'm not saying all first responders are going to become robots. 
<coughs> that said, what this means is, the challenge, I, I believe, as we look at this, is not mass unemployment, but mass redeployment, exactly what this board thinks about. And so again, this is not New York City, this is uh, you know, the US and global. But we're talking about millions of people potentially having to change their occupational categories going forward. Um, again, one of the we looked at this uh, again. This is based on current requirements, and we know these will change. But roughly speaking, we'll see an increase in occupations that have higher educational requirements than currently, and then a potentially decreases in. Um, Occupations that, for example, only require secondary school, at least currently, these could change. And finally, uh, one other source of concern, right? So the question, is there, is there enough demand for labor? Probably. Is there a tremendous challenge in terms of transition? Seems like there will be. Will people be paid enough? I mean, I, I think you're all aware, right? I mean, that you know, the historical research says in the past few, <coughs> couple decades, um, you know, hollowing of the middle or increasing pressure on mid-wage jobs. As we model it out, again, in China and India, basically all, all wage categories increase. In the US, you could potentially, as a result of these trends, see this continue. Now, we didn't model out all of the dynamics around labor, um, supply, and demand. So this is a purely static view in terms of what we currently pay people to do. Um, but basically, we see a potential decline in minimum wage jobs. You might ask, well, how can that be if we say we actually need it? You said, you know, skills are increasing, or skill requirements with regard to educational attainment are increasing. Why is that? There are a bunch of jobs which actually require, you know, relatively high or at least middle-level skills. So elementary school teachers, you know, the, um, uh, some home health care, which requires some level of skills, but we have chosen not to pay very much in this country. And so again, you know, we, I, I think that's another concern of things uh, to think about. Um, so, you know, again, uh, we never give policy advice, but we've talked about some of the things that need to happen. Uh, one is that we need to continue to have economic growth, dynamism, aggregate demand increasing, uh, but also continue to see innovation so we create new jobs and activities. Um, investment in human capital, which is everyone, what everyone around the table here does. Um, actually, labor market uh, dynamism about being a match uh, supply and demand. But also, as you know, people have seen in the Times, for instance, you know, we're at multi-decades low in terms of geographic labor force mobility. Um, lots of reasons why that might be true, but again, you know, that's historically been one of the things that allowed this country to continue. Um, and then also rethinking income and transition support. Uh, and yeah, one other way to think about it is, um, you know, I, I was talking with Barbara Chris earlier. Um, First of all, it is terrific the investment that this board is making in terms of transitioning, in terms of retraining. But I think what, because this, these trends are going to affect everyone throughout their entire life, you know, we complain as much as we want, or we, we sorry, complain is the wrong word. We want to improve our K through 12 education system, right? We, we talk about it all the time. But it, it works pretty well in a lot of cases, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's decent, at least. But I think the challenge now is how do we retrain people past the first two decades of life? And if you think about the investment that we look at New York public schools, right? If somebody knows what the budget of that thing is, right? And then compare that to the budget of this organization. And I understand this is not the only place where retraining is going on. But if you believe that, in fact, we're going to have to retrain everybody throughout their entire career, and I know we've talked about lifelong learning for decades, I think that really is the grand challenge for the next couple of decades. And so I think that's something worth thinking about, and I know this board is just thinking about it, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk. Education Fund. We're the biggest uh, municipal public sector union in the country. Uh, we're already creating an AI index to track the impact of uh, AI and automation on about a thousand different job titles. Um, 
we did not have the piece where you kind of listed the physical, social, emotional as a, as a, as a framework. And I think it's going to change the way that we begin looking at how to track the impact on jobs. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, my question is actually about what the impact on local economies. Uh, I think a number of years ago, Bill Gates made a comment about how we, we may consider as a society having companies that employ more robotics and automation that they would actually pay through the payroll taxes on robots that are doing the jobs that humans used to do, uh, and think about the impact of a loss of income taxes. And so as an economist, I'm wondering if you could talk about the, the economic impact of automation and robotics on local economies. Um, thank you for the question. It, it turns out that uh, my professional training is as a computer scientist. I'm just an enthusiastic amateur when it comes to economics. <laughs> <laughs> Surrounded by real economists, as it turns out. So uh, thank you for allowing me to, to masquerade. Um, first of all, look, it, it, like everything, you know, these trends are local, right? I mean, and, and you know, I said it takes you know maybe decades for these things to happen. We describe it as slow in macro, but fast in micro. If you're the individual who's affected by it, if you're the individual company, worker, it's had its effect, it's going to happen fast for you. It doesn't matter if the rest of the economy is happened decades later. So it's going to happen. It, these things hit home locally. I absolutely agree. Uh, by the way, I encourage you, there's another AI index um, called A100. If you Google it, there's a bunch of work going on. It's not at the occupation level, but it does track capabilities in AI. So that might be something else to feed into you into your work. Also, the, we've, this uh, report is freely downloadable from the web as well, so you can take a look at that. I'm happy to, to, to talk with you more. Um, so, uh, you know, again, Bill Gates is a super smart guy. Um, uh, great respect for what he's accomplished and what he continues to accomplish. Um, and this idea of a robot tax has come up. Um, and uh, first of all, uh, I do think we need to be able to fund the important programs uh, of today and, and hopefully tomorrow, right? So I'm, I'm not up here as an anti-tax crusader. Um, that said, when we're, th and, and by the way, I understand the, uh, the, the sort of intuitive uh, attraction of a robot tax, right? If robots take our jobs and we need to help people in their jobs, well, let's tax the thing that took our jobs. I, I think that I'm all actually, like I understand the attraction of that. That said, if you come back to that other point that I made earlier, which is that we badly need robots and AI in order to in increase our productivity. Because without productivity growth, we're not going to grow the economy, and then the pie gets smaller for all of us. And that, you know, when people think that their children will have worse, worse lives than they do, you know, a lot, that, that's, that, that, that is a discouraging you know, place to live. So, so my view is, um, and again, I'm not speaking for my firm, but my personal view, um, is that I, I think we need to fund important programs, but I would almost want to tax anything else other than robots. Underwear, uh, you know, <laughs> colored pencils. Because I think we need more robots, and to the extent to which public policy is meant to provide incentives for, for you know, discourage things we don't want, encourage things we want, I think we need more of those robots. We just need to make sure we can fund the programs that allow people to be redeployed. So again, I, I, and I think we need to fund them. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, I'm not easy tax, but I think we, you know, if you tax the thing that actually would provide it, you know, a, additional productivity, I think that's, that's a tough decision. Yeah. Yes. So you, you, if you go back a slide, you say um, rethink income and transition support. So you just mentioned product, you mentioned a couple times productivity. One of the things that we know is that although productivity is increasing, wages are not. Um, necessarily for at least the sort of body to bottom 50 percentile of workers. So, and I really appreciate that you said that these were choices, right? That these are macro level choices that are being made. So I wonder though if you could I I expand on sort of the rethink income and transition support because that's a, the slide before that where we saw what, you know, what we're essentially seeing is middle skill, low wage jobs, right? So if you go back to the American choice of very seminal report in workforce development, it was high skills or low wages. We're now in a situation where we're gonna end up with high skills and low wages. What do you think the remedy is for that? You know, so I think a lot of people are other table are aware, right, that there's decoupling between productivity and incomes. Um, you know, some of the other MGI research that we publish um, shows, I think, between 2004 and 2015, um, does anyone want to guess uh, what percentage of U.S. households did not increase their market incomes? So just, just in terms of uh, wage incomes, roughly speaking. Um, 80. Yeah, roughly 80. 
Now, yeah, roughly 80 percent. Now it turns out when you net in um, all government programs, you know, public sector transfers, etc., that goes down to single digits. So you know, a lot of the programs that were put in place post the Great Recession actually were super helpful. In fact, it reduces the percentage of overall outcomes that U.S. households had um, less than those those in Europe, which is actually interesting. It's a little bit surprising, perhaps. Um, so that all said, I, I think the reason why this decoupling has occurred is, is controversial. A lot of people have talked about it. By the way, it's not the first time this has happened um, in history. During, uh, you know, during the Industrial Revolution in, 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 uh, in Britain, you know, people complained about the Luddites, right? They thought that it turns out the Luddites were right, that, that you know, those machines were really bad for their incomes. There was an entire period where Productivity increased because of the Industrial Revolution and the workers did not benefit. Some people call it Engels Pause, right? So this, and for decades. So this has happened before uh, and it's a real concern. Um, uh, again, we don't provide policy uh, recommendations, but I, I think to your point about choices, which I think is a huge one, um, I, I'm, I'm encouraged, uh, but you know, I have the privilege of talking with a bunch of uh, corporate executives at times. There are those who say, you know, basically a Henry Ford argument, right? Unless we pay our workers more, they won't, you know, they won't have enough, you know, money to buy the stuff that we make. And so we do know of companies which are simply choosing to wait, you know, increase wage rates, um, and they do that partly for their own benefit, right? Because they think they'll have a higher quality talent, and you know, <coughs> pension will be lower, higher, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think there are things that can happen because people choose. And by the way, you know, nurses and you know. Teachers, I mean, we can make those choices. Um, there are public policy levers you can pull as well. So, you know, whether it's EITC, et cetera, I, mean, I think there are a number of things that can happen. Um, but I do think in many cases it does, and we can incent different, you know, again, we, uh, it's point, pointed out by a colleague of mine, we have all kinds of policy incentives for R&D, for capital investment, and very few for investments in human capital. Right? And so, I mean, I think there are, um, a number of things to think about, um, but I don't think we cracked the code as to how to how to change that trajectory. Um, you know, so, and, and organized labor historically has been part of that been part of that story as well. Yes, Hi, uh, Laura James, UPS. I found it very um, interesting that um, in certain areas nearby, like in um, the Lehigh Valley area, where there used to be a lot of traditional manufacturing work um, around many of our existing facilities. We're seeing large distribution centers pop up. And um, they're providing a lot of work for people at a competitive wage rate, nothing close to what many of uh, the people in the area had been accustomed to when there was more iron work or manufacturing. But, um, I would say livable wages, but as we look around, because now we're competing with those distribution centers for those jobs at UPS, they're building these facilities that they are utilizing workers, but we know from experience they, they're all set to be automated, and they're going to be massive amounts of people that they're hiring currently that I would say within the next five years, those jobs will all be gone. And you know, not that UPS is standing on a moral mountain. We just have large existing facilities that just it's not economically feasible for us to automate them. But we recognize what they're doing because in places where we create new facilities, we know that these are all poised to become automated. So my question to you is, what can local communities do to kind of be more proactive to recognizing the trajectory that they're on because you know they're employing large amounts of the local population and unlike um, places like UPS because we have constraints because we're a unionized workforce they're racing towards automation so in less than a decade you'll have it once again thousands of people displaced so a few things I mean um we're trying to, to inform the debate with this research. Uh, let's assume facts still matter, right? I mean, let's, uh, um, I think it's helpful. Sorry, I shouldn't say stuff like that, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm 
being recorded, it's actually really fun. <laughs> um, uh,